Father, we thank you for this day. We glorify your name. We say may all glories and adoration be ascribed unto your mighty name in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for counting us worthy to be participators in your program and purposes. And for every opportunity that you grant us to co-partner you in what you are doing, we count it a privilege. We say may all the adoration praise be unto your mighty name in Jesus name. We ask that one more time that you come to witness that which is captured in your cancer so much so that our lives will be left transformed and changed, imparted in Jesus mighty name. I'm supposed to be speaking on the topic of the praying grace, the praying grace. So in the next few minutes, I want us to go through the scripture and if time allows, we will do a practical. It so happens that this kind of teaching is a practical teaching. It is a resultant effect of people trying to put in practice the things that they have learned about prayer. When you hear about the praying grace, it means that we are trying to practicalize. We are trying to bring into organic dimensions the things that we think we should have been able to do. We have known a lot. We know what to do, but how do we do it? We know about prayer. We know we should pray. But the problem now is that we are finding it hard to pray. And in many cases, we have even attempted to pray. But it seems as if it is not flowing the way it should. Prayer should be a river, a well that flows from inside of us. I want to hear the sound a little more. I will... I will show you a few scriptures as witness to what I want to say and establish some doctrinal path from it and then we trust God to grant us access to what he's saying. If it is true, then the Holy Spirit will be able to bear witness to what is his, his word. The Bible said that holy men speak as they were what? Carried. For every word of the scripture is as a result of an inspiration. It means that even though men are speaking, we cannot trace the utterance to themselves. The utterance is actually a communication of something divine. It means that we cannot um, depend on those men for the actualization of that utterance because the integrity of the utterance goes beyond the man that is communicating it to the owner of those words. So if it is true, then we have to hold the integrity of God responsible for the actualization of his words. Men are just conduits. They are oracles to convey the mind of God. But if, we, if exactly we want what God said to come to pass, we will not hold the speaker responsible. Eh? We will hold the owner of those words responsible. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Bible said there, I will pour. Say after me, I will pour. The Bible said, I will pour. So, I, 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 um, as soon as you hear, I will pour, it is representative of something that is movable, or rather, something that is moving. Am I correct? Something that is moving. It is moving. And when you go through the scripture, you will find out that the scripture mentions water in two different aspects. When water is flowing, it
it is representative of the spirit. When water is not flowing, it is representative of what? The world. Now, but when you hear, I will pour, it means there is an outpouring. It means something is flowing. And whatever we are talking about in this context has to involve the spirit as a person and the spirit in his ministry. And if the spirit as a person is the one that is the engineer, and the Spirit's ministry is the one that is at work, very soon it will become evident in our midst that there are structures that the Spirit, by his ministry, is trying to set up. So, initially it will seem as if it is an outpouring, but there is an ending view. There are structures in our life, in our territory, that God wants to set up as, an, as a result of the activity of the Spirit. God wants to set up something within you as a result of the activity of the Holy Spirit. But what it does fundamentally is to move, is to pour. The resultant effect of the outpouring of the Spirit is that something will be set up in your heart. That thing that is set up in your heart is not something that goes and comes. It is a facility. It is like somebody is elected maybe a governor of a particular territory and the governor comes in in the con in nigerian context and said that my job now is to build roads are you with me my job is to build roads so the outflow of that man's administration led to the the installation of certain infrastructures and structures are you getting the point the governor came and the coming of the governor is the advent of an administration but the flow of that administration will yield certain structures are you getting where i'm going there is the person there is the office or the ministry and there are structures that come as a result of the outflow of the administration of the office so what the holy spirit does is that it comes as a person and according as the scripture has told us in the book of acts chapter 2 one of the proof that the office of the christ is activated is that the spirit can be poured it means that the possibilities that is captured within that office can now be poured out the bible said in the book of john chapter 16 verse 12 and verse 13 Jesus was speaking to his disciples. He said, I have yet many things to say to you, but he cannot bear them now. But he said that the Spirit is coming. And one of the things the Holy Spirit will do, he said that he will take of mine and minister to you. He will not speak of himself. This is what he means. He means that what we need to carry out the process of our calling, the demands of our destiny, the demands of the ministry to people and to territory and to a generation cannot be sourced in ourselves. Meanwhile, those things, those resources are already in Christ. According as the scripture said, it said, in him dwelleth the fullness of Godhead, what? Bodily. The Bible also said that God is the one at work in us, both to what? Will and to do. That means you are you are not found anywhere in this arrangement. There is no place that you are found. God is the one willing and God is the one doing it. Are you getting the point? It means that at any point in time that God or rather that we are able to achieve and accomplish anything in God, it means that it will look as if we are the one doing it. Are you with me? But it is actually God that is doing it. He does it in us through his spirit. And the name of that investment that he bestowed upon us, that enabled us to do that thing, and it is looking as if we are the one doing it, yet it is God doing it by his spirit, is what we call grace. So when people like us pray and pray and we don't stop, and God is able to use us, all of us, to accomplish his purposes, in the man looking at it, you say, Kai, this man can pray. No, he's not the man, he's a is a praying spirit. It's a praying spirit. Huh? There is a grace that he ministers to your vessel. So when you come and stand and pray, men can look at you and think you are the one. But there is a grace at work. 
God is the one that is at work in us both to will and to do there is a realization that has to dawn on you and that is why many of us when we come even though we prayed mightily yesterday we come we realize that there is a throne there is a government that administrates the possibilities that is captured within the grace of prayer and we begin to ask we begin to align help us to pray help us help us the bible said come to the throne of grace to receive help in the time of need Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem what I didn't hear you the spirit of grace and supplication the spirit of grace and supplication In literal terms, I will pour upon you the grace of prayer, the grace of supplication. I thought people pray because just because they want to pray. If all your prayer endeavor is as a result of your personal discipline, God has not helped you yet. And there are many things you will not be able to achieve for your life talk more of the demand that God is placing upon us for a territory except God pours out the spirit of grace and supplication it is an apple it is a spirit it is a spirit and, and until that spirit comes demands will be coming upon our life that we cannot be able to service there will be demands we will not be able to service, service it. There will be things we will be echoing. Many times we won't even catch the body. We will not be able to execute it. Remember the three fundamental demands of prayer in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 26. The Bible said there that likewise the spirit helped our infirmities for we know not that's the first demand. What we should pray for Number two, as we ought to, but the Spirit helpeth our weaknesses. So, in these three phrases, is represented the three challenges of prayer. The three challenges in praying. Number one is that we know not. Let's assume you know. Even when you know, you don't know how to. Is it not true? Even when you know how to, you don't have the energy. There is no strength to bet. Huh? We have come to betting. We are pregnant. It is time to give birth. But there is no strength. There is no strength. There is no strength. I was opportune to be in a service where a man of God came. And he is a powerful prophet. And he came and said, there is a woman here. And that woman, there is a spirit of death that is hanging over your life. And I've actually seen a coffin that this coffin is meant for you. Will you be able to fast for three days and pray for certain hours? Are you getting the point? So that this death will be destroyed and cast away. So in this case, we have been able to solve the issue of what to pray for. Is it not true? Number one. And number two, the man was also to, able to receive wisdom. We have been able to solve the issue of how to. Is it not true? But there is a third problem. There is no strength to deliver. We have come to give him bed. We have seen how devil is trashing our life, our territory. But we can only complain. We can only wish. We can only hope. We are the laborers. We are the watchers. We are the men that we stand in the gap. It is first of all a matter of the heart. It is an inward stirring. When the grace comes upon you, there is a restlessness that is within you that cannot allow you to allow one day to pass without investing in the demands of the body. It is not just that you know that something should happen. How many people are yielding to it? After that 
that meeting, many days passed and another meeting came. I was also in the meeting. The prophet began to prophesy again. And suddenly the Lord opened his eyes and he came and met the woman and prophesied again to the woman and said, I see you. I see you in a coffin and the coffin now is inside a grave. Pray, pray like this and fast like this so that this thing will be broken. Are you getting the point? The woman went back. Was not able, not as if she doesn't want to, was not able to abide with the demands of the prophetic, the demands of the information that God gave. That season passed. Another third time, the prophet came to another meeting and said, I see a woman. I see a woman. You are inside the grave now. They are about to cover the grave. If you can pray, you will be rescued. If you can pray. If you can pray. So Moses later, the woman in this context died. I was one of the officiating ministers that buried her. What is the problem now? Is it that we don't know what to pray for? Is it that we don't know how to? There is something that is missing. There is no grace to pray. Too many knowledge about prayer. Too many ways. People can teach you hundred ways to pray. Things to pray now. Pray. You can't pray. That means that there is something that is not stirred. There is an activity that goes beyond the flesh. There is an activity that goes beyond the flesh. It's easy to talk about prayer. The real thing about prayer is actually praying. It's easy to talk about one hour, two hours, three hours. When you now pray, then we know that you have known prayer. There is no teaching in prayer that is complete until people actually pray. No matter what you teach about prayer, the real school of prayer is in praying. The real school of prayer, you will never learn prayer until you pray. It is in praying that we learn how to pray. That is where men are actually schooled. Many of the things you have in your head as what is what is prayer will change when you start praying. Many of the things you have in your head of how we should pray will begin to readjust when you experimentally begin to interact with the matter of prayer. Many of the things you think is correct will begin to adjust. Many of your views, your knowledge, many of the things you gathered from books and conferences and places will begin to shift. Many of your stand will begin to readjust when you actually begin to pray. You will find out that there is a wisdom that begins to enter into your being. You cannot explain it, but it's stronger than things that can be spoken. It is a spiritual intelligence. When a man begins to pray and pray, long. Hey. That man is like a person that comes before the presence of a master spirit. Something begins to reorganize his life that is beyond the natural. You will know that this man's life is galvanized by supernatural forces. And these forces and these activities can never be explained by any man. You just know that there is something that cannot be demystified about this man's activity. And such is the destiny and possibility of an intercessory company. Priesthood. Priesthood is the gateway to accomplishment of purposes. The purposes of God are eternally linked to priesthood. It doesn't matter what God wants to do. If priests does not arise and stand in the place of what it takes to accomplish those demands, 430 years after <laughs> the children of Israel are still in captivity in Egypt. Is it not true? But what did the prophecy capture? The prophecy said 400 years and we rescue you. 430 years later they are still in bondage because there is no man that has arisen. There is no man that will stay restored. There is no man that will say not in my time. Not in my time. I will invest my sweat. In my time, revival will come. In my time, God will change things. Huh? Nothing is happening. Because instead of agonizing in the place of prayer, people are organizing. What can bring down the hand of God is not organization. It is agonizing. Huh? 
In fact, in some cases, it's no more trainings that we need. It is more travails. In the place of travails, you cannot substitute travail. No matter the training you give people, it cannot substitute the place of travail. Travail like a woman in bed. Bed pants, bed pants, bed pants. Travail, travail. Keep traveling until new things are vetted from the Spirit. I pray that the Lord will grant us wounds strategic enough to bet the purposes of God in this realm in the name of Jesus Christ. This set of men are the most important to God. Beyond what we want, beyond what we think, there is a purpose that is traveling from God to this earth. And men need to midwife it. Intercessors, agonizers. My time is fast spent. There are a few things I need to uh, highlight. How many minutes have we gone so far? I think I have about 40 minutes. How far have we gone? 20? Huh? Okay. So we have gone half. For me to be able to explain this, Zechariah chapter 12. Verse 4, verse 10. I think we need to touch one or two scriptures. Matthew chapter 14, verse 33. says, and he take it, who in this context, Jesus, and he take it, James, Peter, and James, and John, <laughs> you know, anytime Jesus calls Peter, James, and John, then the matter is serious, this is the innermost counsel, you know, when you read the scripture, you will find out that um, there is a counsel of the 500, sometimes there are 120, sometimes there are 70, there is the 12 that he chose. Is it not true? Guess what? Amongst the 12, there is also a three. Once Jesus needs the strongest of men and the strongest of hell, he calls for these three. Who are they? Peter, James, and John. It can be bigger than them. It can be more serious than them. Help cannot be outside of these three people. They are the strongest men available in the ranks. But look at this scripture. In verse 34. Okay. And he took it with him, Peter and James and John, and began to be so, am so amazed and, be and to be very heavy. And verse 34. I will say it unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here, self me, tarry ye. And watch. And he went, and he went further a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And when he cometh, he findeth them what? Sleeping. <laughs> and said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? What's the question he asked him? Couldest not thou watch what? 
watch here and pray lest thou enter into temptation the spirit is what willing but the flesh is what there is something Jesus quickly introduced here and that is the basis of my teaching he said the spirit is willing the flesh is what weak so even Jesus understood that the reason why these people are like this is because they have not been able to tap into the resource of the spirit this scripture did not end here and I hope you know this prayer here is the most important prayer session that has ever taken place upon this the face of the earth this is actually where the matter of our salvation was determined if Jesus did not win here it's over it was the testimony of the book of I think Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 let me be sure Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 and what? Supplic so that you know what we are talking about. When he had offered up prayers and supplication with a strong cry and with tears unto him that is able to save him from death and was heard in that he what? Feared. If you continue in that scripture it will continue explaining to you this is Jesus now in the days of his flesh he raised up prayers and supplication to him that is able to save him and he was heard. That means are you with me? This is the most critical moment in our the salvation journey where Jesus needed to pray so that he will be able to execute the demand of purpose in his life. If he has not been able to execute it, all of us who wouldn't have been here co participators in the inheritance of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not even been, even if we, we want to, not even being able to execute anything for God because all the purposes of God is found in Christ. And the way for us to participate in it is for us to partake, to have a part in it, to be co-opted into it. And the co-option into it is as a result of the fact Jesus is the owner who we are brought into it by Christ. Are you getting the point? But the Bible said he raised a strong cry and he knew that that prayer session will be like that. So he said, I need three people to help me in this prayer. I need at least three. Who are the strongest? And he checked his ranks. Just as God checks, he comes to a nation, comes to a territory. He begins to check for strong men that have the capacity to stand. Is it possible that the way you are agile, the way you are strong, the way you preach, the way you teach, can we trust this man? The way you are saying things need to change, can we trust you? So he called them, said, come, let's pray. It seems as if you don't like the things that is happening. It seems as if we want things to change. Come, let me take you to the place where things can change. And he carried Peter, James, and John. The Bible said, when they went there, they slept. There is no grace. There is no oil in the lamp. The vessel is dry, 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 dry. What I mean is that some of them, I can, in this our context, some people can, can actually pray in tongues. When they wake up in the night to pray in tongues, they will do shalama, ma, ma, la, la, ma, la, and sleep, sleep off. This is the person that God has called and say you are a watchman. The watchman is sleeping. Oh, watchman, what of the night? The only reason why the enemy can invade is because the watchman has left their destiny. They have left the guidance, the watchmen, the gatekeepers. They have left the place that God has committed to them. Meanwhile, the testimony of the scripture is, I have set watchmen upon my walls. He didn't say, I will set. <laughs> he said, I have set. Now, whether the watchmen have realized their ministry is another thing. Whether they are executing their ministry is another thing. 
whether they have received the grace to execute their ministry is another thing. Whether God has said, God cannot live a land without a solution. And many times the solution is with people and those people are around until men arise to their duty. Nothing will change. These are the heavy men that went with Jesus. They are actually apostles. It is not about title. It's about a grace. It's after me a grace. Apostle Peter was in that prayer meeting and he slept. Apostle James was in that prayer meeting and he what? He slept. Apostle John, the prophetic apostle, was in that prayer meeting and he what? He slept. Titles cannot make up for your lack of grace. So on that day, their titles did not defend them. Where Satan comes, he doesn't respect the title. He respects your capacity, your grace to tarry in the place of prayer. And the men that can stand for God on that day are men that have received grace of God to stay in the place of prayer. I need to tell you, prayer is the mother of all purposes in God. Prayer is the mother of all manifestation. Prayer is the mother of all projects. There are many things that can happen, many things that we need. First thing we begin to do is to what? Pray. We need to pray first. When we pray first, then other things we begin to find their bearing. Including people that will stand up for us and do things. They can never arise to the demand of their destiny until men begin to pray. When you pray for long, then God will begin to activate the resources, investment, and men that he has placed in the territory to make for the recourse and salvation of the people. Those men are there. Many of them didn't even, have not even realized that they are carrying so much until prayers begin to fry in the spirit. And as a result of that, there is a precipitation of the purposes, ordinations, anointings, abilities that is lying fallow in the territory, that is lying fallow within men. There, there are judgments, scrolls, lying over lands and territories that are never open yet because men have not cried out. The Bible told us in the book of Revelation that there were men that, that the Bible said, that they came before the throne of God and they were petitioning. They said, we died and our blood was shed. And the resultant effect of um, our, ourselves dying for the sake has not come yet. And they are petitioning. These are scrolls. These are judgments that are written, hanging. And nobody has interceded enough to bring down the judgment of God upon the land. The righteousness of God, they are contained in scrolls. It takes intercessions to bring it. The men of prayer, oh, that will rise in prayer. That God will pour. That He will pour. That He will pour. That He will pour. That He will pour. The Spirit of grace. Working on his own, something will be frying. You can resist it. It is oh my god, it overshadows you. If it's the spirit, it will overwhelm, it will overshadow, it will seem as if you can't keep it on the inside. If you want to, it, it will just be coming.
our strength, O oh God. towards a dangerous end and the dangerous end is this that the basic tenets of the apostolic culture was about to be eroded by a lesser importance even though some people might not agree that some of the things that we think are important are not important according to the scripture the, that book of Acts chapter 6 verse 4 said why, why are we being consumed by these things said, okay, let these people be doing that. But we, ourselves, we do what? Give ourselves to what? You see, he said we will give ourselves to the ministry and prayer. Now, the reason why I read here is remember, this is the same Peter and the same apostles that could not watch with Jesus for what? One hour. Now, Jesus is no more there. Yet, they are saying that we will give ourselves to the ministry of the word and prayer. What happened? Are you getting the point? What happened between Gassamene and this post-Pentecost experience? It's after me, the Holy Spirit. It is when the Holy Spirit came because I hope you know, in the place that Peter, James, and John were the weakest in prayer, that's where Jesus obtained the greatest answer in prayer. So is the problem, are you getting the point? You will find out that the problem is not with, is not with God. It's not as if the grace is not available. The problem is with the people there. In the same place, you are complaining that it can't happen. Somebody stayed there and he was praying and had the greatest result. So somebody can say, I mean, I'm in US, I'm in UK, I'm in Europe, I'm in Africa, I'm here. So in this place, we can't actually pray like this. I mean, that your excuse is eroded. It's eroded when we place it side by side with the demands, the instructions, and the possibilities of the scripture. You were given the Holy Ghost so that those excuses will go. Every of the excuses that a man gives as the reason why he is not able to meet up with the demands of priesthood has been eroded as a result of the advent of the Holy Spirit. The same Peter that could not stand for one hour has made prayer his occupation. Somebody saw me and said, the, the way you are praying, I want to pray like you. I want, how can somebody actually pray like this? The way the person is talking, he's speaking as if I was born this way. Even if you prayed well before and you prayed it in the flesh, eh? that season has passed. You are being introduced to another regime. There are people that have willpower. They, are, they, are, they have willpower. So they can use their willpower and pray for three hours. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 
be prayer energizers as a result of the workings of the Spirit. Because of time, I want to show you four major components of the praying grace. When you see these things, you know that you have contacted the praying grace. All of them, or at least one of them, for many times, all of them is the proof. Number one, the prayer anointing. Number one, the prayer anointing. What is the prayer anointing? The prayer anointing is something that is encoded in your prayer endeavor that makes the prayer to produce more impact per unit time, per unit exertion. This is what I mean. Sometimes when you start off in the prayer ministry, are you getting the point? You will notice that for you to get something to shift in the spirit, you might need to pray for three hours. When you become consistent in praying, after two years, three years, five years, or ten years of being consistent in prayer ministry, you will notice that it will take you less time to achieve the same thing. Is it not true? It means that the prayer anointing has increased. Not for you to increase your number of prayer, your um, time of prayer, but it means that you can affect more. In three hours of your prayer now, you can affect affect more things huh? heavier, more effective, more powerfully than you would have affected with your three hours prayer before. Are you getting the point now? So the prayer anointing increases the effect, the impact of your prayer on things or people per time. Per unit time. That was number one. Number two component of the praying grace is the prayer power. What is prayer power? You can call it prayer power. Some people can call it the tarrying grace. This is what it means. Your capacity to last the length of the demand of the body. Are you getting the point? Your capacity to what? To last the length of the demand of body. To you outlasted the demand that is being made on your prayer life. Are you getting the point? For example, you have a body to pray about something and you notice that um, as you kept praying, kept praying, as you kept praying, the prayer went from one hour to two to three to four to five and then you got tired and stopped. You stopped. Eh? Not necessarily because the, are you getting the point? That is not because the burden has been discharged, but because you can't go further than this. But the burden has not what? Gone. The tarrying grace or the prayer power is somebody came to pray and he, he, he kept praying. One hour past, 12 hours prayer, 24 hours later, people are still praying as if they started praying now. What can keep somebody praying for 24 hours nonstop? Say after me, prayer power. Many times, huh, the person knows that his human capacity cannot carry him this long. There is a grace that is at work, and he gave you the capacity to tarry, to tarry, to tarry. It helps you to tarry the length of the body. Many times, what we mean to tarry the length of the body in prayer power might be beyond a singular event. Are you getting the point? It might mean that the event can start today and continue tomorrow. But what it will do to you is that it will bring to you flashes of consistency. You do it today, you continue tomorrow. Continue. You kept until the body is what? This child. So number one is the prayer anointing. The number one, two is the prayer power. When prayer power is available in a place people that cannot pray for five minutes, you suddenly see them pray for, for one hour. You suddenly see them pray for three hours. Something is making them to go that 
connect. Amen? You need to understand this so that you will be able to navigate through the path of the grace that God is releasing in this season in the name of Jesus. So, number three, the one you are conversant with is what I term the prayer energy. The prayer energy is actually what many people probably identify as prayer power. These are the energizings and the quickenings that come to your spirit. You know, sometimes when you probably, I will use the night, you wake up in the night and you want to pray and you are praying in tongues, it seems as if your heart is down, is low, is it not true? And then you probably pick up a worship or you pick up a message and then you listen to it and then the person there spoke and something fired into your spirit and quickened you up. It's like the valence electron of your soul became excited. And once it became excited, eh, you will notice that there will be energy that is released within you. On the strength of that energy, you can press in into God. Hmm? These energizings can actually affect your physical body. It can affect your physical movement. So sometimes, if it's um, if it's some of us, when we pray, you can see somebody, he will stay like this. Huh? And he can stay like this for the next two hours. Now, for you to know that that thing is a supernatural enablement, when you do it, when you do what he's doing by yourself, you will have waste pain. But him as he's doing it, he's joining into God. Now, you can even see it, and if you are not educated in these things of the spirit, you can castigate it. Huh? Not knowing that it is an energy that is holding that person. You can see a young lady, once that image comes, she will charge. And you will know that something, it will seem as if this person is possessed. Something will be exuding from your being. For some of us, when the energy comes, it comes like might. It's compounded strength. It will seem as if they gave you the possibilities of 1,000 men. When such energy comes in your being, sometimes God will, through your vessel, eh? When that energy is poured through your vessel, God can do the work of 1,000 people. Many times, some people have angulated them, their vessel in such a way that God can pour in them that energy and they can accomplish what them people can do. You will see yourself, you are laboring. You seem as if you are like a, a, a lawn mower. You are mowing the lawn, mowing the lawn. You are like a tractor and you are moving through the harvest field and you are a heavy duty machine and you are in the field you are like a tractor and you are following the ground and you are going just like that you are going it's a heavy duty machine when he puts his teeth on the ground the bible said i have made thee a sharp threshing instrument yeah, there is a sharp threshing instrument when it comes to a land that is hard, he pulls the teeth of his whip and by an energy, it begins to go deep. Even if the land is hard like rock, huh? the energy, the prayer energy, it kept increasing, kept increasing, kept increasing. Suddenly, there will be an atomic release. Fire! The person will be
this is the supernatural strategic leadings in prayer. The supernatural strategic leadings in prayer. It is not as a result of the fact that you study the book. Once the prayer grace is activated, suddenly you begin, you begin to pray. You just know supernaturally how to handle a matter. Are you getting the point? Even as you are going up, you'll be seeing the path that is opening up in the spirit. It is the prayer grace that is working. You will know, are you with me? How to navigate through different demands of priesthood, legal demands, energy demand, kinds of prayers, when to move from praise to worship to chant to groanings to all of them. You know how to navigate the path. It is an intelligence. It is an intelligence. Huh? You know how to draw out prayer points from scripture. You know how to move a prayer demand from one level to another level. You, you can see the patterns of spiritual progression in the demand of the prayer. Not because you read the book, but because something is something is being precipitated from within you. Once that grace kicks in, you just know how to engage now. Can we pray? In the next two minutes, there must be something you need. There must be something you need. Ask God, I'm not going. For some of you that have a measure with me, your measure.